My name is Terry Harrell. I'm 66 years old, soon to be 67 in April. Uh, I'm from Waukegan, Illinois. Uh, I was born in Libertyville, Illinois, which is about 20 miles west of Waukegan. And I served in the Army from March 7th of 1967 till March 8th of 1969. Thank you. Okay, so could you describe Terry Harrell, the man before Vietnam, and Terry Harrell after Vietnam? And how were these two people different, if at all? And if they were different, maybe could you tell us what caused these changes? Uh, they are drastically different. Um, before Vietnam, I was a pretty average student, I would say. High school, I went to a large high school, uh, participated in athletics, and uh, in school I had a lot of what they called shop classes, which involved uh, mechanical drawing. It has now, it is now called uh, computer-aided drafting, but there were no computers then, of course. Um, and I had woodworking, I had some architectural drawing. So my background in high school was uh, geared toward graduating from high school and going out and getting a job. I had no intention of going to college. Because of that intention, uh, I was drafted in uh, March of 67 with uh, the knowledge that uh, I was probably going to go to Vietnam, as most people who were drafted did at that time. And um, I didn't really have any strong feelings one way or the other whether I should go or I shouldn't go. Uh, Waukegan was a real industrial town, so very conservative. And so when you were drafted or when you graduated from high school, a lot of guys uh, joined the Army, Air Force, Marines. It wasn't unusual. But because of the Vietnam conflict that was just starting up, there was some controversy, but not a lot, uh, especially amongst the students. We didn't really talk about it very much. I had a couple of friends that had joined the reserves, the Marine Corps Reserves, and then they went, and that summer after I graduated, they went to their... Uh, basic training, and then they came back, and they remained in the Reserve Marine Corps for, for a number of years after that. But some of the stories that they told me about some of the guys that they had met that had been shipped off, and this was in 1966, and then came back, uh, made them feel like maybe they should get rid of their reserve status and join uh, I don't know what you would call it when you get rid of your reserve status, and and then you just go into the Marines full time. Uh, but I think, on second thought, they thought better of it. Thought, why do I need to go there? You know, and I think their parents probably had something to do with it also. Um, either if they talked to them, but they probably talked them out of it. So, when I was drafted. Um, I went to Kentucky, and I did basic training in Kentucky, and that's eight weeks. And then I went for advanced infantry training down in Fort Polk, Louisiana, which was the home of the Vietnam soldier. There was a huge sign that, that announced that when you came in there. So there was no doubt where you were going. Uh, and then I went to a, a small little country, or country, a small outpost in Panama for some advanced, advanced infantry training. That was about almost a month. And that was to learn how to set booby traps, uh, set up mines, claymore mines, and what they call fields of fire. So if you're camped somewhere, you have a, an idea of where you should put the largest armament that you have, like an M60 mach machine gun, 
uh, and you set up your mines and you set your booby traps if you have if you're carrying any at the time, uh, and so that helps you maintain your perimeter when you're out in the field. Well, after that, I came home for a month and then I got shipped there, and I spent my year in Vietnam, and I came back, um, and. I remember my parents having a party for me when I got back to Waukegan. And um, we, and there were a lot of people there. And it was really nice to see people and, and to, to see everybody again. But I didn't feel like I belonged there. Um, I couldn't really talk to them about things because they would really didn't understand uh, what I would be saying. You know, they tried to imagine, but it was hard for them. And and uh, I I really missed the guys I had been with a lot. Um, so I I remember going back to our house after our party. And then I asked to borrow my parents' car, and I went down, and I spent the night on the beach and watched the sun come up the next morning. And I did that for probably a week. Every night I would go to the beach. I didn't stay all night after the first night. But it, it helped ease my mind somewhat. Um, and so then I kind of eased back into uh, the friendships that I'd had, and uh, I met some young ladies. That really helped. Um, and I ended up going to school uh, at a little school called uh, Western Illinois University. And the reason I went there was because they had a veterans organization. And that really helped me because there were veterans there that had kind of experienced the same sort of things that I did. But I remember at the time that there were not a lot of combat veterans. There were support veterans, like they had been in the artillery, they were medics, a lot of the guys had gone to Korea and to Germany. Um, but as far as being a combat veteran, of the good 30 guys that I knew, there were only two of us that had actually seen any combat. And that was kind of shocking. Um, but, you know, as, as time went by there, and I went to school for two years there, but I ended up staying in Macomb for five uh, because I had some living to catch up on, so to speak. Uh, I wasn't a real good student when I first went to, to college. Um, but I sure did have a good time. And so in 1975 then, um, I met my wife. And I was having a lot of problems up to that time. Um, some drugs, some alcohol, which was not uncommon. Um, but as soon as I met her, things really changed, turned around my life a lot. So I really owe I owe my life to her, I really think. She was my savior. She's my, still my guardian angel, I think. I, that's the way I refer to her as. She uh, brings me lots of luck. And uh, I was really a lucky person anyway. Um, I was in some instances when I was in Vietnam, uh, and I, to this day I don't know why I'm here and why it's not somebody else. Uh, what, why I made it through and, and that they didn't. And, I, and I'll get into later about some of my friends and that feeling is not unusual. But uh, I did eventually come back to school, but I came here to the U of I and I had a really nice advisor, a guy named Henry Shreddle. He was at the Department of Education, 
and this was in the late 70s. I want to say 1977. And I remember walking into his office, and he was so nice, and I told him my story. He said, if you really want to go to school here, we can get you in. He said, you're a veteran, and they'll give you special treatment. And I, that's I said, well, it's all I need is a chance, and I promise I'll do better than I did when I was in school before. And I did. I, uh, I graduated in 1980, got a teaching job. I taught industrial arts, which was kind of what I did in high school, <laughs> same sort of thing. And I went up to Watertown, Wisconsin, and I taught in Watertown, Wisconsin for 25 years as a full-time teacher. And then I got tired of it, and I went out and I started working on my own. And we were still in Wisconsin. My wife was uh, working for the University of Wisconsin in Madison. So she had been there for a long time. And uh, she was a public health nurse and was working with the Indian tribes in the state of Wisconsin for uh, public health facilities. So it was, it was it was interesting to listen to her talk about her work. And at the same time, we were living in Madison then. We had lived in Watertown for a number of years, moved over to Madison for about eight years, and then we went up to northern Wisconsin uh, in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. We were up there for two years. And then we ended up coming back here for family reasons. So this is where I am today. Um, a lot different from when I was 18 years old. And I, if you would like me to sort of fill in the gaps about what happened in Vietnam, I can, I can tell you some of the things that I remember. Um, I think I, I mentioned before that after the month of March in 1968, I don't remember anything. I can't remember names or faces or places that we were, except I remember the day that I left that country, and I remember that vividly. Okay, so I want to backtrack a little bit to you, newly drafted, 18, 19 years old. Sure. Right, and you said that they asked you to, they taught you how to set up booby traps? Yes. Right? So what's going through your mind when you realize that you're, I mean, what they're asking you to do? Um, I wanted to learn as much as I could because I figured the more that I learned, the better chances I'd have to survive. Uh, I was hoping that I never had to do that, and you know what? I never really did. We never had to set those things up. Um, so the things that you learn, boy, you forget them fast. I, I did learn that because when I got in country, uh, the first patrol that I went out on we set up that first night, and uh, my friend Frank, who was my squad leader at the time, said, hey, he said, take this Claymore and go set it up out there. And I, I looked at him, and I said, you know what? And I said, I, I can't remember how to do this. So he had to show me again, uh, and it was real simple. But other than that, we, d we didn't do that very often. And so um, that part of my training, uh, I never really had to use. Uh, and thank goodness that the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong didn't have the types of mines and materials that we had because th they are devastating. When they go off, it's just, it makes your head explode. They are so loud. And they're real vicious too. So thank goodness I never had to use those. And you never you know, experienced any Maybe any NVA or VC mines going off, or um, no? They, you know what? Where we were, there were there were a lot of mortars, which are these tubes that they have, and they drop the round inside this tube, and then it shoots out. Now they were really good with those, um, but as far as booby traps, you you would be walking on a trail and, and you would notice that somebody before you had probably stepped in this booby trap. And they, I know uh, they used to say that they would fill them with punji stakes, they're called, which are 
pieces of bamboo that they slice in half, and they take water buffalo dung and they stick it on the end of the bamboo. And then the idea is you fall down in this little hole and the bamboo thing goes through your shoe. Yeah, and but I saw several of those, but nothing that looked, it looked, looked like it had, somebody had tried to set one up. But fortunately, nobody really stepped in one that I knew of. Uh, which reminds me that in Vietnam, when you're when you're traveling from one part of the country to another, you want to stay off the trails. There are trails that civilians use to go from one village to the next. You don't want to walk on those. You want to walk on either side of the trail, which means a lot of times where we were, there were lots of rice paddies. So you would walk in the rice paddy instead of on top of the rice paddy dikes, which was unfortunate because they were nice and dry and the rice paddies were wet, of course. So uh, you were constantly soaking wet, constantly. So could you tell us a little bit more about that, maybe the sights and the smells? If, is there anything that you smell today that reminds you of what it was like to be out there? In the, the um, cow manure smells a lot of like water buffalo manure. Uh, water buffaloes were to the Vietnamese people, they were the workhorses. Usually, if the family had enough money, or even the village had enough money, they had maybe one water buffalo for the whole village, and they used the water buffalo for their rice production. And I can't really tell you exactly how one of those things worked. I just remember that of the hundreds of villages that we walked through, Water buffaloes did not like Americans, and they could smell them for a long ways away. And they would get real agitated when you got close to their village, you could hear them. They would be bouncing around in their pens if they were not out working in the field, and the little children were the ones who could calm them down. They were like their pets. And so you wanted to stay as far away from the water buffaloes as possible. and. Um, I remember one day uh, we it was it was uh, in October, and we uh, we came upon this village and and we had set up outside the village, and we started receiving some sniper fire from the village. And at the time, we were with a group of. Uh, mechanized infantry that was the 25th infantry division they rode on top of these things called apcs which were large what they call personnel carriers and usually on the apc in vietnam you didn't ride inside it you, it could carry up to eight people i think and uh, the bottom the back dropped down you would crawl inside there, walk inside and sit down, and you could travel from one place to another. Well, in Vietnam, you rode on top of these because if they hit a mine or something, the people inside would be killed instantly. So actually, there was only one person that was inside of this, and he rode in, he was the driver, and he was in the front. On top of the APC was a 50 caliber machine gun, a huge gun. Um, can do a lot of damage. The bullets are about this long. I mean, they are just devastating. Well, when we started receiving our incoming fire, whoever was in charge of the 25th Infantry at the time, that, that particular platoon decided that they were going to fire above the village and sort of hoping that the snipers were in the trees and that they would hit them, and then the sniper fire would stop. Well, some of these guys, of course, got carried away, and they didn't hit the trees. They went lower and started peppering the whole village. So by the time we got done with the 50 calibers, and then we all walked in there together, uh, there wasn't much left. I mean, these things are big enough. They can, they can cut down trees. There were dead animals all over the place. And, of course, there were a couple of water buffaloes that had been killed. Fortunately for us and for the children and the people that lived in the village, they knew we were 
we were there. And what they usually do is they have little bunkers inside their little hooches. And uh, they fortunately went inside these bunkers. So when we got into the village on that particular day, there was no loss of life except for the animals. But, but when you lose a water buffalo, you have no means of probably getting another one. So I don't know what happened to them after that. We just kept right on going. We didn't stick around the village after that, and I don't remember where we went afterwards. Well, could you tell us a little bit more or take us back to your experiences with the civilians or the villagers? Sure. Um, the, the, one of the first people that I met when I got to Vietnam, uh, first civilians, was in the village of Chu Lai. And um, she was a laundry girl. She was a little girl whose parents did laundry, and that's how they made their money. And it wasn't unusual for a lot of the service guys to bring their laundry in to have the Vietnamese do it because they did a really nice job. And uh, the village was safe, and I made friends with this girl. And I got to see her, oh, probably three or four times during the year that I was there. And I think it was the second time that I went into the village of Chu Lai. We had been out in the field for a long time. I want to say 30 days, maybe, maybe three or four weeks. And uh, apparently I had lost a lot of weight because the first thing that she said to me was, Terry, you're buku skinny. Now, that means you're really skinny. <laughs> and uh, most of the, a lot of the Vietnamese spoke French real well. Which I didn't, but uh, she was nice enough to invite me to come to her parents' Uh, I want to say it's it's not a, a house like you would think of as a house. It's a big thatched roof building. That was that was their house. But her folks were so nice. She asked me to come to dinner at their house, and so I was the guest of honor. Uh, and it was really strange. I, I there, there must have been ten people in here. I was, and I didn't understand a single word that was being spoken except uh, Kim, which was her name. She could translate pretty much for us. And her dad wanted to talk to me. And he wanted to give me a whole bunch of money so I would go to the military PX in Chu Lai and buy a bunch of watches and then bring them back to him. And that would be, he would sell those. He would sell the watches to whoever he could get to buy them. It was kind of like on the black market. Um, and I told him, I said, no, I, I really can't do that. It's, it's against the law. I could get into a lot of trouble. And he dropped that right there as soon as I said no. He didn't press the matter at all. But his real intention was he wanted me to take his daughter to the United States. He wanted me, and he said, you know, you, if you can take her, then we can all come over there. And this was in 1967. I had no intentions of taking a Vietnamese girl to the United States, but he thought it was worth a try. And come to find out that my, one of my good friends, Tony, who was uh, also a squad leader there before my friend Frank was, um, he had asked him the same question. Um, but uh, I don't know what happened to Kim and, and her family after I left him in August of 67. Um, the, I guess the, the time that I remember as the most vivid was the, we had been out on patrol and we had been receiving on and off fire from different places. And, uh, we somehow got separated from, we, we were with our platoon, which is about 30 people. Uh, an army platoon has 30 people. And uh, our squad, which was con consisted of about eight to 10 people, um, we somehow got separated from our, the rest of our platoon. And we started receiving a lot of heavy fire. We had had quite a bit of action the, 
the day before uh, this particular incident happened. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, all these rounds of artillery started coming in on top of us. And my squad leader, Frank, thought that you know, we had run into a huge uh, group of NVA soldiers. Um, and that's what I thought at the time, too. Um, but I think come to find out later on that our unit was got separated in such a fashion that part of our pl platoon was up higher than we were. And when we started receiving a few mortar rounds from, from the Viet Cong, part of our platoon thought that these mortar rounds were coming from where we were. And so they started shooting at us. And of course, we returned the fire. And then our lieutenant called in artillery, except the artillery didn't go where it was supposed to go. It came in on top of us. And one of the, there were, there were two casualties that day. Um, one of them was a, a sergeant by the last name of Cumbie. And my squad leader, Frank, uh, I remember that he held on to him because Cumbie had been hit pretty badly and he ended up dying right there in the field. Frank had gotten hit where his arm was pretty much just kind of hanging there, which I, I didn't think he'd ever be able to use it again. I had a big bunch of shrapnel in my shoulder and that had hit my shoulder. It had gone through my backpack, and I think that's what saved me from having my shoulder sliced open enough was it had hit my backpack first, which was had a bunch of sea rations in it. And um, destroyed my ham and beans, by the way, which was not a good thing. And But it saved my life because uh, the shrapnel that they took out came close to my to my lungs and my heart, but um, didn't go any farther. Anyway, um, I remember getting on the helicopter and Frank and I were next to each other and uh, our Sergeant Cumbie was in the body bag that was in front of us. And uh, I never really thought very much about Sergeant Cumbie because I didn't really know him very well. He was, um, he was what they called, what we used to call a lifer. And that's the guys who join the Army for, for life. That's their career. And usually, the people that are, are lifers, there's not very many of them in, in the uh, infantry. There's a, a lieutenant in charge of a platoon, and there are usually three sergeants. They're usually the lifers. The rest of us were all draftees, pretty much. Um, and Cumbie wanted to get his combat infantry badge. Because if you're a lifer and you get that combat infantry badge, which means that you've seen combat, it gives you a chance for promotion a lot sooner than maybe somebody else would get it. And so he had been out in the field and he was learning from our, our sergeant named Cooper. Cooper was supposed to be showing him the ropes. Uh, it didn't work out that way. He, Cumbie lost his life he had only been out in the field for one week, I think. And uh, he died. Years later, in fact, let's see, this is 2015. In 2013, um, my friend Frank and I had been, had got back together because we hadn't conversed or seen, so we didn't know each other even existed because we had lost touch. And I'll tell you that story after this one. Um, 
Sergeant Cumbie's wife contacted Frank's sister somehow. I don't know how. Frank's sister did a lot of research. And so his wife contacted Frank, wanted him to come to their house so he, she could meet him because uh, she kind of, she had gotten information from, from the Army and kind of knew what happened. And she knew one person held on to him when he died. She didn't know it was Frank until later. And then when she found out, she really wanted to meet him. And he said he didn't think he could handle it, meeting her in person. But he would be willing to talk to her on the phone. And so they talked for quite a long time on the phone. And we come to 2013, we have a, a reunion, a 196th Light Infantry Brigade reunion in Washington, D.C. I didn't know we had these things, but a bunch of people that were in the squad I was in, we all met there. And for all of us, it was the first time we had been back together since 1967. And when we were at the reunion, this usually goes on for four days, they had a memorial service at the wall in, in Washington, D.C. And there were two people that came there, and it was Sergeant Cumbie's children who wanted to meet us all. It was his son, who was also had been in the Army, and I think currently still is, and his wife. And so they had this movie camera, and they took pictures of all of us. And, and uh, we went to the wall, and we found where his name was and everything. It was, uh, it was a, a very touching moment. And I think it really helped Frank a lot to finally be able to see these folks and, and talk to them. And, um, but his, his Sergeant Cumbie's wife didn't, didn't uh, go along, didn't come along with her, with her children. And I, and I don't know why, but um, my friend Frank and I, Frank Monturi is his name. If you if it's M O N T U R Y, he uh, came this close to getting the Medal of Honor for what happened that day. If you Google his name, you'll you'll get a hit right away. It'll say Frank Monturi. Uh, bunch of information, and if you click on that, it'll tell you the story of what happened that day and how he received it. He, he received a Silver Star, which is the second highest award that you can get. And he certainly deserved it, too. Um, things that happened then, uh, he has really no recollection of what went on uh, for a large part of that. He can't recall anything. And so myself, my, my friend Roque Jasso, who uh, was our squad member, uh, he's one of my best friends. He lives in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, my good friend, Carlos Rossi, he lives in Menford, New York. He was with us. Uh, our, our medic doc was with us at the time, um, and uh, Tony Lawson, who lives in Middleboro, Kentucky. And Middleboro's a beautiful little little town that's kind of down in the southeastern part of Kentucky, near the Cumberland Gap area. It's just gorgeous. Um, those, those were my friends that I had spent most of the time with. All of them rotated back to the United States uh, during the months of uh, November and December and January. Uh, right after the Tet Offensive started up, uh, a lot of those guys left because they had already been in country for a year. So we've got a whole new group of people. Those are the guys that I can't remember. I've tried, and uh, 
I can't, I can't remember faces or names. And I was with these guys for five months, and I don't know why I can't remember them. I've tried to ask, I tried to find out some information about where some of them might have been. Um, at our reunion that we had, I thought maybe I'd see some faces that reminded me, you know, um, and I didn't. And I'm hoping this next reunion, we, we have another one in Daytona, Florida, <clears throat> in uh, the end of September of this year, and uh, hopefully we'll get, I'll get to see them then. I, I'm really hoping, because the longer the time goes, the, the more you forget. Um, and, and these guys, you don't want to forget them. You know, I mean, they're, they're your best friends. And they always will be. Um, but but um, Frank and, and Roque and Tony and I and Doc and, and uh, Carlos have a, a kind of a special relationship in that we had been through six months of combat together, and that really draws you close to people. And I always said that if I had ever survived, if I was going to survive, whatever happened after that, it would be a piece of cake. Because once you go through something like that, nothing can be that bad. And it hasn't been. Um, I've had some, I've, I'm lucky. I'm a very, very lucky person. And so um, my life has been really good. Can you tell me how you were emotionally and spiritually different after returning from Vietnam? Yes, I emotionally and spiritually different. Um, spiritually, when I was there, I think, I think I said, God, if you just get me through all this, I promise to be a good boy when I get out of here. Um, emotionally, I, uh, I, wasn't do, I didn't do too well when I first got back. Um, but I, I think I mentioned before that uh, we had a strong veterans organization in Macomb, Illinois. And uh, just to talk to people, even though they hadn't been through the similar circumstances, just to talk to people that were my age um, really helped a lot. The person that helped me the most was my wife. Um, she's really the kindest person I know. Um, and uh, has a giant heart. And she, uh, whenever I made mistakes, and boy, I sure made a lot of them, um, she made everything okay. And so uh, I'm miles from where I was when I first got back. I'm, I don't receive any uh, counseling at the time, right now. Um, as opposed to m most of my friends who have terrible post-traumatic stress syndrome. And it's a real strange set of circumstances. They didn't, they didn't uh, have this PTSD to the extent that this, like the soldiers from Afghanistan and Iraq have it. It wasn't immediate, it came on way later in life. And I can give you a good example. My friend Tony uh, has a real good business in Kentucky. And he was sitting at his, at his uh, desk one day and he just started crying. And he had no idea. It was, it was uncontrollable. He went to counseling at the VA and they ended up giving him a 100% disability, which means that his, he had a business. He uh, pretty much turned over his business, I think, to one of his children. And he's, he's a lot better now. I mean, he, to talk to him, you wouldn't know there was anything wrong with him. 
he does get a, a compensation. Uh, the Veterans Administration gives him 100% disability, which means he gets about $3,000 a month for the rest of his life. Now, my friend Frank has the same thing. His post-traumatic stress syndrome actually led to finding me. Uh, he, he is now 100% disabled. My friend Roque, he's about 75%. He has his legs real messed up. Uh, and he has uh, some substance abuse problems, which is really hard to take because uh, he's such a nice, sweet kid. He's not a kid. He's a man. but um, And he's, he's had, uh, let's see, two, two marriages. His first, his first marriage fell apart. He had some beautiful children, though. And we had a great party when I went out to Phoenix at his house, too. But um, my friend Doc, he was wounded terribly, and he walked. He has a real hard time walking, and he has lots of head trauma. And then there's me, and I don't have any of that, and I don't know why. Can you tell me more about you, though? Like, what does combat do to an 18-year-old young man out of high school, learning how to shoot, learning how to kill? What was that like? Um, when you first experience it, it makes you physically sick. You lose control of your bowels sometimes. It's disgusting. As you get older and you see more of this, you become very hardened and you don't give a shit about anything. You just, you get to a point, and I remember that point was, I think it was the end of January, and I just said, these guys aren't going to get me. Whatever I got to do to survive, that's what I got to do. And the, I think one of the ways you survive in combat is you have to get down and dirty, and you get nastier than the next person, than the people that are shooting at you. And so you do whatever you have to do to survive. You, you, get a, you have to take an attitude that uh, it's either you or them. That, that's, that's the way that I made it. And you said before that there were instances where you can't believe that you're still here. What were those moments? Um, we, we had a sergeant. These poor sergeants, they take the brunt of the, of the war. And he was another guy who was, and you know, I don't even remember his name. It's really sad, but we were close to this island and we had been getting a lot of fire from this island and there were snipers all over the place and they were in these little holes called spider holes. And they have a clear field of fire but you can't see them. They can definitely see you. And we had, we were in, caught in this rice paddy dike area. And so we were kind of trapped. And, and we couldn't really go, couldn't see our way to go back. And so we sent four people over to see if they could dig out this one spider hole that was right in front of us. And I remember the sergeant. And I, I wasn't with him, but I, I did see what happened. He threw, took, <laughs> took his grenade out, pulled his pin, threw it down in the hole, and he was, he's supposed to wait a little bit. Otherwise, the guy's going to do exactly what he did. The thing came flying right back at him, right outside the, the hole that he threw it into. He didn't, he, nobody got hurt on that one. This guy, the sergeant, eventually made it back to us, and he was right next to me. For some reason, he poked his head above the dike. And when he did that, he got hit right through the head, right next to me. And I thought, you know, right, I was going to do that <laughs> right before he did that, but I didn't. 
Now, why I didn't do that, I don't know. During, uh, during the Tet Offensive, we were in a village. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember exactly which, where it was. And there was a grenade that dropped right in back of me. It didn't explode. I, I don't know why. So that's why I say when I'm lucky, those were two instances right there that I have no explanation for. It just, I'm still here. Can you briefly describe the Tet Offensive? Yeah, um, the, the Tet Offensive in 1967 really was supposed to be a, a celebration of the Chinese New Year, which they, they have every year. And it's on the, I believe, the 30th of January. Um, for us, it, was, it turned out to be just horrific um, because they had been stirring all these weapons. And then that night is when they started their attacks. And that's when our warehouse got demolished. And it was all my valuable pictures and everything went up in smoke. It really ticked me off. Um, but we, the Tet Offensive to me then made sense because of all the, the light action that we had had up to that point was getting ready for this. And then when they came out, they were, they were all over the place, North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong. They were in every little city and village in South Vietnam. And a lot of them were like suicide bombers. I mean, they just, they, they came at you and they wouldn't stop until you killed them. Now that never happened to us. It was not that severe. I, re I remember that during that night that uh, we were uh, outside of Da Nang, which was where most of the Marines were stationed. And boy, the rockets were just pouring into that city. And we knew that something was unusually happened. And then we, we, get, we had to do a search and destroy mission right after that. Uh, we were sent up to a place called Way, spelled H-U-E. It was the, uh, at one time was the capital of Vietnam, um, since had moved to Saigon. Um, but there were a lot of North Vietnamese in Way. Unfortunately for the Marine Corps, most of those guys had to go in there and get them out. And our, the unit that I was with, the 196th, was supposed to act as a blocking force. They were supposed to move the North Vietnamese out of way toward us. Well, we didn't see that many that really made it out of there. I think most of the North Vietnamese died in way, and it took the Marines Oh, quite a long time to get them out of there. It was uh, it was another lucky instance that I'd say I'm glad I didn't have to go in there and do it. And I feel really sorry for those guys that had to do that because that was it's house to house it's it's hand to hand combat fighting. I never had to do that. I never wanted to, and I'm not sure if I could. I don't know if somebody was that close to me. I don't know what I would do. You talked about being hardened by the experience. Was that a night that changed you um, with the rockets going into the city and your body was... Um, no, I think it was the fact that so many of... Uh, I was in Alpha Company, Company A, 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry. The company that got hit was Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry. I knew a bunch of those guys. Uh, um, after that, I started, that's when I started, that's when I got angry. Um, I, I can say, though, that when I joined Charlie Company after that, the guys that survived it were really mean and really nasty. And we would go into certain villages and they would just start beating people up for no reason. 
especially older folks, and that's disgusting. I got into my very first fist fight as an Army soldier because of that. Uh, he, Dave Choked was his name, and, and he was so messed up in the head, he shouldn't have been out in the field anymore. And he started beating up this old guy, trying to get information out of him. And the old guy was so old, he didn't know anything. And that's when he and I got into it. Um, that, that just does things to your mind. And I don't know, I just, uh, I never could, I never wanted to harm children, and especially, and I never harmed, I actually never harmed anybody as far as uh, civilians. The only people that I took my frustrations out on were what I viewed as the enemy. Who was the enemy? Well, there, there were regular North Vietnamese soldiers called the NVA. They were battle trained. They were really good, really good fighters. Um, most of them, I think, were probably the same age as I was. There was the Viet Cong guerrillas. Uh, these were the guys that probably, again, the same age as I was, maybe even a little younger, that, had, that lived in the village and tried to, uh, during the day, and then at night would pull their, uh, whatever duty they were assigned. And most of the time, those guys, I think, moved information and, and uh, weapons and food. North Vietnamese had to depend largely on the South Vietnamese population for their food because they couldn't carry enough. They carried little bags of rice. Um, if, you, if you've seen films, I guess, uh, you, you, one of the things I think they talked about was how light the North Vietnamese were able to travel. It was amazing they could go so far on such a small amount of food and water, which made them really tough. And then there was the, uh, the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese, and then there was, I, I think that pretty much is the only two groups that I ever faced. Um, going back to, to the civilians, how often did you witness violence against civilians and destruction of villages? Um, destruction of villages, quite often. A lot of times they burned them. And then they would take the civilians and they would relocate them. Um, where they were relocated to, I have no idea. They would bring in these big helicopters, put the people on the, on the uh, helicopter and take them to another area. Um, in the area that I was in, in, in the northern part of the country, I don't, we didn't do that a lot. We, d we didn't really do that very much. I think most of that took place in the central and southern part of the country. Um, and so I never witnessed a lot of it. It was occasional. Why were villages burned? Um, well, it was... <laughs> That's a good question. Supposedly, that would allow, wouldn't allow allow the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong to use that village as a place to store weapons, to get, to get their food, and so they'd have to go someplace else. It makes no sense. The whole damn thing didn't make any sense. The war didn't make any sense. It was just something that you myself were caught up in a period of history that I was so young I didn't know any better. If I would say if the same thing happened to me now, there's no way that I would go there. No way. When did you start feeling that the war didn't make sense? Um, probably when I had my own children. Um, at Having, uh, I have a daughter and a son, and uh, I had my daughter first. And uh, when she was born, I 
it kind of changed me. Um, I realized how precious life was. Up to that time, sometimes I questioned it. You said earlier that you don't remember some of your friends. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I don't know. I have, I have the, my friend Frank uh, has the same problem I do. Now my friend Roque has a really good memory. And if we have questions about things, we have pictures and stuff, uh, he, he knows who, who these people are and we don't. And I, I don't know why. He's just, uh, he's amazing. His memory is amazing. Mine's not. <laughs> you also talk about your wife being your savior. Mm -hmm. Where did she save you from? Probably myself. Um, I had some substance abuse problems, not anything that was real se I considered severe, but enough where I consider myself kind of lazy. And uh, she convinced me that I, there was a lot more to me than I thought maybe that I thought I had in me. She uh, made it such that uh, I, f I felt like I could be a good person and I had something to offer. Why didn't you feel like you could be a good person? I don't know. Uh, I think because of some of the things that happened to me in the past, um, uh, when I was in some classes at Western, I noticed that some people treat you a little differently. Um, that bothered me. Um, it's a little uncomfortable asking this, but why did you use drugs and alcohol? Uh, they were there. And one of the things that we used to do when we would go through villages, we'd look for marijuana. Uh, there was a lot of it. And if you found it in the villages, it was free. If you get it from the, the rear area, you have to pay for it. And so we were always looking for some extra. Uh, it calmed us down. Um, you didn't know if you were gonna make it from one day to the next, so you really didn't care too much. The alcohol was provided by the Army. Um, it was in the form of beer, it wasn't hard liquor. They would, uh, if you were in a pretty safe area, they would helicopter the, a whole bunch of beer and, and soda out to us in big garbage cans filled with ice. And you're supposed to only get two to three beers per person, but some of those guys didn't drink, so they would just give them to you. So if you walk through our perimeter at night sometimes, I would imagine 90% of the guys were asleep because they were either drunk or stoned. And that's the truth. I've also heard about this thing called fragging. Mm -hmm. Does it ever happen in your experience? Uh, I've heard of it, but I, and I, I heard one of my friends with the last name of Adams was sent to a prison because he tried to do that to a lieutenant. But if that happened, I think it was after I was switched companies. I was an Alpha Company, and he stayed in Alpha Company. I went to Charlie Company, and I had heard rumors that he had done that. And knowing Adams at the time, he had a real quick temper. I can imagine somebody must have made him real mad. I don't know if he was successful or not. Earlier, you, re you said that you remember the day you left Vietnam vividly. Can you tell me about that day? The day that I left? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, in fact, I can go back just a couple days before that. A week before that. I had been on a what they call an in-country R&R, which means they, they fly you out of wherever you are. You, can, you come back to your base camp, put on clean clothes, and you have three days of vacation. Now... Uh, 
there were places in South Vietnam that were just gorgeous. And this one particular particular place was called Vung Tau. It's now a huge resort area. If you Google it, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Um, I spent three days there. And then when I came back, I thought I had to go back out in the field for my last week in country. But the, there was a, uh, a sergeant, supply sergeant, that uh, I had been talking to, and he said, well, you know, the guy that maintains the, what they call the emergency perimeter uh, sirens that are supposed to go off when you get rocketed or attacked or anything, you're supposed to make sure the sirens go on. So you have to stay up all night to do this. I got that job. So I didn't have to go back out in the field, uh, which was like I knew then I was going to go home. And I was... Um, but, of course, I didn't stay awake all night. Uh, I partied all day, as hard as I could, as much as I could, with as many people as I could with, and I slept at night. So if the rockets came in, I have no idea. But I, the last day that I was there, uh, there were uh, all the guys from my squad in Charlie Company, who I was in charge of at the time then, because I was the squad leader, they came to see me off at the airport in Da Nang. And uh, I remember looking out, and there was this giant jet that was there, and that was my ticket home. And so when we got on the plane, uh, the stewardesses were civilians. It was a long ride back to Seattle. That's where we where we landed, and we did. St oh, we stopped in. Uh, I, we stopped in Hawaii for a layover for a little bit. So I did get to go to Hawaii once in my life. I think it was for four hours. I haven't been back there since, unfortunately. Um, but uh, then we landed in Seattle, and then I, from Seattle, to, I went to Chicago. And can you give me a comparison of when you first arrived in Vietnam, like the scenery, and compare that to when things started getting uglier? Um. The, when you first land there, you land in a real safe area. Um, I landed in a place called Cameron Bay, which was a huge Navy and Air Force facility, um, just like being in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, beautiful, uh, huge bay, it was just full of crystal clear water. Um, the food there was really good. The Air Force really had some guys that knew how to cook. You stay there when you come in country until you get assigned a unit. And then as soon as you get assigned a unit, it takes about two days. Then they, uh, you take a helicopter or a plane, depending on where you're going. Uh, I took a helicopter up to uh, the northern part of the country, and that's where I met the, the, uh, my friend Frank and, and Tony. And all these other guys were there. I was the the new guy. Um, they were called FNGs. I won't tell you what the F stands for, but the N stands for new, and the G is guy. You could probably figure out the rest. Um, but um, as soon as I went out on my first patrol, it was like from a safe area, and and there was what I pictured as that Vietnam would be like. It was rice paddies, it was little villages, lots of palm trees. It was really pretty, but I was so scared. I remember carrying the weapon that I had was an M16, and I remember that my, you have a, a safety on your weapon and I remember I had my thumb on that safety and my finger on the trigger. And I figured I, I was going to be quick enough to pull that safety off and fire that weapon if I had to. Fortunately, I didn't have to. But, uh, I, I'll never forget that first patrol that I had. And it was just short. Nothing happened. Came back. It was just fine. Okay, fast forwarding. When you came to the University of Illinois, what was it like, and did you have support? 
Um, when I came to the University of Illinois, uh, I had I was married, and uh, my daughter had just been born. And um, I got into the industrial technology program, and um, I didn't have I didn't hang around with any other students. Uh, I do remember being in a math class at Alt Guild Hall. And I was way older than all the students in there. Most of those kids were 19 years old, I think. And they were freshmen. And they were, I had to take, um, oh, I don't know if it was trigonometry. Some math class that I took that I found incredibly difficult. I had no idea what was going on. But somehow I passed. Um, that was the hardest class I took, but I didn't really hang around with any of the, the kids because they didn't have anything in common with them. My, my, my whole goal was to finish in two years and get a teaching job and then leave. Did the people support the war at the university at this time? At that time, it, had, it was over with. Okay. It had ended in 75. What about at Western? Um, you know, I think it was a pretty conservative area in Macomb. It's a beautiful little town in the west central part of Illinois. Um, other than the veterans organization, which was, well, we were, we were considered liberal, I guess. Um, and the people that hung around with us kind of thought like we did. I think most of the townspeople were pretty conservative. Although, you know, generally around universities, people are a little more liberal than uh, the rural populations are. Um, so we had a, uh, we had a, they, we, I remember we had one parade that we marched in, and it was called the Vietnam Veterans Against the War Parade. And whether they were, we were for or against it didn't make any difference. We just marched in the parade. They needed a, a group of people to do it. It was a small town. So we volunteered and we did that. That was the last I heard of anything that, of, of a, the parade or anything. We did have a good time because we, uh, we had this one particular bar in Macomb, Illinois that we used to hang out in and most of the veterans did. And so uh, we all met there when we were done and one thing leads to another and we have a party. So did you ever encounter anyone who was against it or? Um, oh, sure. Um, a lot of the students I had in my first English class when I went to school there, I'd, I'd say almost every single one of them were. Uh, and I can remember the name of the English teacher I had. Her name was Mercer. And she sat on her desk, and she wanted to talk about the Vietnam War, and she knew I was a vet. She didn't know exactly what I did in the war, but... Uh, most of their comments were directed toward me. What did they say? Uh, they wanted to know if I had killed any children. I remember that question. Um, I got up and walked out of class, and I never went back. I took an F for the course. Were there any other moments like that? No, that was the most vivid one. I remember after that, I... I um, I went in and tried to get into another class, but it was too late in the year, in the semester. And it was quarters. They had quarters there. It was too late in the quarter. Uh, so my hours dropped down uh, because I you have to take a, a full load in order to receive benefits from the Veterans Administration, the GI Bill. And I think I had dropped down below full time. And so uh, I took a cut in pay. Do you have like an inspirational story or an inspiration or a moment of hope about the war or your experience in Vietnam? Um, I never thought about it as being a struggle of right versus wrong. I always thought it was a struggle of me versus them. Who is them? Um, the people that were my enemies at the time. Um, 
come to find out later in life, they probably were not because they just wanted freedom for their country. That would be the same as if somebody came into our country and tried to tell us what to do. I think that's the way they felt. Is there anything else you'd like to say that you haven't talked about? Certainly. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Veterans Administration, and I'll keep it short. Um, I have a Purple Heart. thought I'd show you this. This is what they give you when you get wounded. But the story of my Purple Heart's a little different because when I actually thought I had been wounded and received a Purple Heart, uh, and I went to get benefits from the VA on my, what they call my DD-214 form, there was never any mention of a Purple Heart. There were lots of other medals and all these things that you do throughout your Army career, and I never really paid any attention to it. Come to find out that if you have one of these, you get free health care for the rest of your life. And in the VA, they give you classifications, a one through six. If it's a classification of six, five, or four, means that you have to pay some amount toward your health care. If you have a three, two, or a one, it's free. Well, this little baby right here makes you a class three, which means you get health care. But I was wounded by friendly fire, not from the North Vietnamese at this particular time. And they didn't award Purple Hearts to friendly fire recipients until, I believe it was, 1984, I think. Congress reversed that law, and because of certain situations, I received this. And so that's how I came to get my Purple Heart. I had to appeal to the Department of the Army, and they did a review. It took a year, and they not only sent me this, they sent me a whole bunch more medals. I have no idea what they are, what they stand for. I just have them. Uh, and so the uh, Veterans Administration did me a favor and awarding me my class three class uh, certification, and so that allows me to get health care. Could I ask a follow-up question, and you'll address it to her, but so the Veterans Administration did you a favor with that Purple Heart, but didn't you earn that Purple Heart? And she tell her. Yes, I, I feel I earned it uh, more ways than one. Um, I actually, all that time, thought that I'd had one. I had been given one. Uh, my brother, my little brother, has a bunch of my medals that he's kept. And there's a Bronze Star and there's a, I don't know, Meritorious Service Medal that they give you and a whole bunch of other little ribbons. You see on this thing, they give you a little ribbon. Um, and I never really thought about it that much until I needed uh, some health care. And, and I've got these hearing aids that I have in. Uh, when I was up in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, uh, there was an older gentleman that I was, I was friends with. In fact, he was, he was my neighbor. And um, I had talked to him about hearing aids, and he said, well, if you're a veteran and then you have a Purple Heart, your hearing aids are free. And so then I, he said, but you have to go to this office in Eau Claire to have them help you with that. You have to have an advocate. And um, I did that, and they started the paperwork rolling. And then I received this after they did my review for a year. You know, I don't, I don't think free health care, you, you shouldn't have to have get wounded and it doesn't matter how you're wounded to be able to get free health care. I think if you're a veteran and you served your country, I think you should be able to get it. I remember before you said that um, the military gives out medals like candy. Yes, they what do. What do you mean like, by that? 
Well, it seems like whenever there's a there's an action, uh, you were uh, they give you these they outline these different battles and uh, that you're in, and they have medals if you if you do something or even if you just survive that particular battle. Uh, you, your your name goes on a list, and you're and you're awarded a bunch of medals. And if you look, if you look at the generals in our in our armed forces, you notice that on their chest they've got all these ribbons and everything. Now, that's why I say they hand them out like candy, because these generals, a lot of them, haven't been through combat. Some have, but I've just you know it. It's just like, well, okay, you're a general and you have to have this many ribbons on your chest. That's kind of the way I view it. It's pretty silly. The whole thing's kind of silly, but that's just my personal opinion. Okay, so you think some of them are undeserved? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, have you met any people of Vietnamese um, descent here in the U.S.? And if so, what was that like? Yes, I have a good friend of mine at the YMCA. He is uh, half Vietnamese. His dad, or, his dad was in the South Vietnamese, South Vietnamese Army. Um, and he had, I think he was there for three years. Um, Blanchard is his name. He is an Iraqi war veteran. And um, his in fact, he's in Vietnam right now as we speak. He goes back every year for about six weeks. And he told me the le one of the times that I we worked out together, he said, if you ever want to go back there and visit, he said, I will go with you. Um, my friend Frank wants to go back uh, to the exact place where he was severely wounded because he thinks that and he held on to Sergeant Cumbie when he died. He thinks maybe that'll give him some closure. Um, I don't agree with that. But, yeah. um, well, for one, I've looked on Google Maps and we, and I had this little map that we showed you that I, pointed out some things before. If you looked on Google, those places aren't there anymore. The names are all different. I think it would be very difficult to find that particular spot. Um, if I thought, if he just went back there just to view where he th thought things happened like that, I would go with him. My wife told me that. She said, you should both go. Um, that's probably still up in the air, but I doubt if it'll ever happen. I remember, I remember you saying um, yesterday that you don't watch war movies. No. Why not? I, I can't handle them. I, um, uh, it's, I don't like seeing people get hurt. And, and, uh, this makes me start crying. So I just stay away from them. Well, what do you consider to be your greatest regret in Vietnam? My biggest regret yeah. there? Was that not all the guys that I had came home with us. I wish we all could have come home together in one mass, have a big party, put us on a big boat, and... Uh, that's my biggest regret. And what's your greatest triumph? I survived. <laughs>